Hello, BookTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. I am your host, Peg. Welcome to another edition of New History on the Horizon, episode 10, where I go over new and upcoming books uh, in the history field. Um, and we're starting off with uh, one I think you can't beat as far as exciting adventure stories, survival stories. Fans of uh, Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand should really love this book. Um, anything having to do with World War II and survival at sea, you're going to love it. This book um, is, I got the finished copy, I've shown it on this channel before in galley format, uh, but this is publishing just a few days from now. So let's see, May 16th. That will be Tuesday. Um, today is May the 12th. I think. Yes, it is. May 12th. <laughs> so we have Lost at Sea. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, Rickenbacker's 24 Days Adrift on the Pacific, a World War II tale of courage and faith by John Wukowitz. Um, he's written several books uh, dealing with World War II, uh, personalities, generals, um, just great war history. And I got the finished copy because the galley didn't have photos. So we've got all this great stuff in here. I can't wait to read it. Let me give you a quick synopsis. So this is coming out Tuesday. So let your library know. They probably already do have it on order. Um, bookstore, yeah, pre-order it if you'd like. And did I mention the, the, uh, the publisher is Caliber Books Division? I think it's Dutton Caliber. It says here... In the darkest days of World War II, an unlikely civilian was sent to deliver a message from Washington to General MacArthur in New Guinea. Eddie Rickenbacker was a genuine icon, a renowned race car driver, a pioneer of aviation, uh, the greatest American fighter pilot of the First World War, and a recipient of the Medal of Honor. Now in his 50s, and one of the most admired men in America, Rickenbacker was again serving his nation, riding high above the Pacific as a passenger aboard a B-17. But soon the plane was forced to ditch on the ocean surface. That is like one of my worst nightmares, let me just say, personal note. <laughs> I flew over the Atlantic when I was in the Air Force, and uh, we hit turbulence so bad. I, I, it was a cargo plane. Um, oh, I just... I, I, I was convinced two of my worst nightmares were going to be realized. I would crash in an airplane in the sea, somehow survive that, and then be eaten by a shark. Um, but anyway, let's get back to Eddie Rickenbacker. So they were forced to ditch on the ocean surface, leaving its eight occupants adrift in tiny rubber life rafts hundreds of miles from the nearest speck of land. Lacking fresh water and with precious little food, the men faced days of unrelenting sun followed by night shivering in the cold, fighting pangs of hunger, exhaustion, and thirst, all the while being circled by sharks. Each prayed to see a friendly vessel on the horizon and dreaded the arrival of a Japanese warship. Meanwhile, as the U.S. Navy scoured the South Pacific, American radio and newspapers back home parsed every detail of Rickenbacker's disappearance, and an adoring public awaited the news of his fate. Using survivors' accounts and contemporary records, uh, award-winning author John Wukowitz uh, brings to life a gripping story of survival, leadership, and faith in a time of crisis. Um, uh, and here is our author. That's great. Uh, so a, just a beautiful volume. I can't wait to read this, even though it will probably um, keep me up at night. Again, two of my worst nightmares right here in this book. But I'm looking forward to reading this, Lost at Sea out on Tuesday. So I want to get this video up so you guys can um, go ahead and get that on order and check it out at your library. Uh, let's see what else we have coming up. We're going to do the upcoming books first. So when is this book coming out? Okay, so this book just recently came out, May 2nd, so I'm a little behind on that one, but it is, this is all about upcoming and new, so it's technically kind of encompasses both. This one is from Celadon Books. This is called, You Have to Be Prepared to Die Before You Can Begin to Live, Ten Weeks in Birmingham That Changed America, by Paul Kix. Um, it came out May 2nd, so I'm going to hold this up while I read to you a little bit from the pub sheet. Um, so, You Have to Be Prepared to Die Before You Can Begin to Live is the first book to zero in on Project C, Martin Luther King Jr.'s daring 1963 campaign to desegregate Birmingham, Alabama. This 10-week operation ultimately defined the civil rights movement and, in turn, decades of activism and the fight for racial equity in America. 
The 60th anniversary, anniversary of Project C is in spring of 2023, uh, tied to this book's release. Um, so this has a little bit of some information from the uh, author, but let me give you a little backup on this that is not in the pub sheet. Um, in May 2020, as writer Paul Kix and his wife Sonia stared at the footage of George Floyd dying, they asked themselves a terrifying question. Could the same fate await their black children? Their kids, who later saw the Floyd video, became fearful, and over the next few days, that fear hardened into a cynicism about America. To try to allay it, Kix showed his children another notorious image from half a century earlier, a photograph taken in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. These two images, nearly 60 years apart, echoed each other. In what ways could the one from Birmingham, of a black teenager, a policeman, and his, long, and his lunging German shepherd, instruct us in how to live today when faced with footage from our own lasting violence? Attempting to answer that question for his children only raised larger ones for kicks. What was the full legacy of the Birmingham photo and of the campaign from which it stemmed? Uh, Paul Kicks brings to life the past and tells the story of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's 10-week struggle in 1963 to do the impossible, to end segregation in Birmingham, Alabama, which was less a city than a site of domestic terror. Uh, Kicks's vivid account captures the horror as well as the hope of that campaign and also provides a window into the minds of the four extraordinary men who led it, Martin Luther King Jr., Wyatt Walker, Fred Shuttlesworth, and James Bevel. Um, and again, this is the book that zeroes in on what they call Project C and brings home what it felt like to live through that spring and how its echoes resound through our culture now. So this book is out now. Um, Paul Kicks, you have to be prepared to die before you can begin to live. Sounds like a very uh, important new book on uh, uh, history of civil rights and how it ties into today. Uh, this is an interesting book that uh, I think it just came out. I was contacted about this book. I had no idea it existed. Um, so, let's see, the publicist was from Globe Pequot Marketing. That's from the what is the publisher's name on this book? Prome this is from Prometheus Books. And this is out now. Yep. And this is called Comet Madness. How the 1910 return of Halley's Comet almost destroyed civilization. <laughs> Look at this. Isn't this beautiful? It's by Richard J. Goodrich. I love this cover. Uh, so I've got the finished copy here. Comet Madness. And it says here, since the dawn of civilization, Humans believed comets were evil portents. In 1705, Edmund Haley liberated humanity uh, from these primordial superstitions, or so it was thought, proving that Newtonian mechanics, rather than the will of the gods, brought comets into our celestial neighborhoods. Uh, despite the scientific advancement, when Haley's Comet returned in 1910, newspapers gleefully provoked a global hysteria that unfolded with tragic consequences. In Comet Madness, historian Richard J. Goodrich examines the 1910 appearance of Halley's Comet and the ensuing frenzy sparked by media manipulation, bogus science, and outright deception. The result is a fascinating and illuminating narrative that underscores how we behave in the face of potential calamity, then and now. Um, so this, this is going to be a fun little read. Um, in an age of almost seemingly constant hysteria and paranoia, um, it's always uh, ins instructive to look back at the past to see how uh, these cycles um, are not new. They just, people are prone to freaking out. Um, <laughs> so Comet Madness by Richard J. Goodrich from Prometheus Books. You can check that out now. Okay, so I have something to say about this, although I can't say too much because I've already written a review of this um, uh, for, for a commission pay, so I don't, you know, can't give away the goods, but I can tell you this is a book. If you're into spying and espionage and Cold War and all this kind of stuff, you need this book. This is coming out June 6th. Um, it's a big read. It is big. Um, over 600 pages. Woo! This is from Simon & Schuster, but man, oh man, I loved it. This is Spies, the Epic Intelligence War Between East and West by Calder Walton. Now, this is my advanced copy. I want to get the, the finished copy uh, once it comes out in June. Uh, but wow, this, I can highly recommend this book. Let me just read to you a little bit about it then. 
the writing was fantastic. It, it wasn't dry. It, it read really well. I'm not going to, you know, give away too much more than that. Um, but, I mean, look at that. That's a big, big mamma jamma. Love it. Spies. You got a glare there, but... This will be the cover. It just has the little bit of the advanced stuff on the, the top there. Spice is the history of the secret war that Russia and the West have been waging for a century. Espionage, sabotage, and subversion were the Kremlin's means to equalize the imbalance of resources between the East and West before, during, and after the Cold War. There was nothing unprecedented about Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. President, presidential election. It was simply business as usual. New means used for old ends. The Cold War started long before 1945. That's what he contends in this book, um, and very persuasively, I might add. <clears throat> but the West fought back after World War II, mounting its own shadow war, using disinformation, vast intelligent, intelligence networks, and new technologies against the Soviet Union. Spies is an inspiring, engrossing story of the best and worst of mankind. Um, bravery and honor, treachery and betrayal. The narrative shifts across continents and decades. From the freezing streets of St. Petersburg in 1917, uh, it's very, it's very encompassing. Uh, it's a broad swath of history, uh, to the bloody beaches of Normandy, from coups in faraway lands to the present-day Moscow, where troll farms, synthetic bots, and weaponized cyber attacks being lost on the woefully unprepared West. It is about the rise and fall of Eastern superpowers, Russia's past and present, and the global ascendance of China. Um, mining hitherto, and this is why this is why it make, this book is so important. Mining hitherto secret archives in multiple languages. Okay, uh, Calder Walton shows that the Cold War started earlier than commonly assumed, that it continued even after the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991, and that Britain and America's clandestine struggle with the Soviet government provides key lessons for countering China today. Um, this fresh reading of history, which it was. It is. Uh, combined with practical takeaways for our current power struggles makes spies a unique and essential addition to the history of the Cold War and the unrolling conflict between the United States and China that will dominate the 21st century. Uh, I can't recommend this book enough. It's coming out June 6th. Um, be prepared for a very meaty read. Um, takes you all through it. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so this is the advanced copy. Don't really have any photos. Just have like, um, there's nothing really I can show you in here. But boy, oh boy, I kind of got swept off my feet with this one. So this is from Simon & Schuster, Calder Walton, Spies. I'm, I'm assuming they're going to have a massive amount of uh, coverage for this. Uh, it's going to be widely reviewed um, and commented on. I'm sure he's going to be speaking in a bunch of different um, um, promotional events and probably speaking at like think tanks and stuff like that. Let's see, so what else can we move on to? Uh, this book is out right now. It came out I think about a month ago. Um, so I'm a little behind in showing you this, but or actually in a month ago it looks like it might have actually come out at the end of last year. Well, no, this is the paperback release, which is I think is new. So this is on the line. Two Women's Epic Fight to Build a Union by Daisy Pitkin. Um, on the Line takes readers inside a bold five-year campaign to organize workers in the dangerous industrial laundry factories of Phoenix, Arizona. Employees here wash hospital, hotel, and restaurant linens and face harsh conditions. And unfair U.S. labor law makes it nearly impossible for them to fight for their rights. The drive to unionize is led by two women. Author Daisy Pitkin, a young labor organizer, and Alma Gomez Garcia, a second shift immigrant worker who risks her livelihood to join the struggle and to whom this exhilarating narrative is addressed. Forged in the flames of the company's vicious anti union crusade, the relationships that grow between Pitkin, Gomez Garcia, and the rest of the factory workers show how a union can reach beyond the workplace and form a solidarity so powerful that it can, trans that it can transcend language or speaking, because I can't seem to transcend speaking right now, uh, <laughs> that can transcend friendship and transform communities. But when political strife divides the union, Pitkin must reflect on her own position of privilege and the complicated nature of union hierarchies. 
today as we experience one of the largest labor upheavals in decades. Pitkin looks back to the forgotten role immigrant women have played in the movement and shows how difficult it is to bring about social change and why we can't afford to stop trying. So, uh, some important social commentary and on the line. Oh, this is out by Algonquin Books. I got the paperback for that. All right. So that one's out now, but let me, and uh, now we're going to jump to, we're going to mix it up today on the New History on the Horizon um, episode. <laughs> it's a Friday. Can you tell? You guys, when I saw this, I was so excited. I, uh, this is one of an amazing writer and historian, um, and this is her, this is her autobiography of sorts. Now, if you have, if you love the Civil War, I mean, as far as history goes, um, and you've read *This Republic of Suffering* by Drew Gilpin Faust, you're going to be extremely, extremely excited to see this new book. It's called *Necessary Trouble: Growing Up at Mid-Century* by Drew Gilpin Faust. It's put, in, it's being uh, put out by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and this one is coming a little later on. I'm kind of getting ahead of the ball. I mean, it's May. This is coming out in. August, August 22nd, but I wanted to get this on your radars. Um, let me read to you a little bit about what this, what, what's going on with her book and why she, why she wrote it. As an acclaimed historian of the Civil War and the American South, Drew Gilpin Faust has devoted her life's work to listening to the voices of the past. With necessary trouble, the time has come for her not just to listen, but to tell. Writing with the insight and candor that distinguish her scholarship, Faust eliminates an era of cataclysmic change through the choices, challenges, and drawing convic dawning convictions of a young, young woman who, from her childhood in segregated Virginia, to her teenage years of outspoken activism, to her first vote cast for a different future at age 21, came of age in it. Let me just take a quick sip, because I think I'm stumbling because um, I've got some dry, dryness. Much better. Drew Gilpin Faust knew that she was born into history. Nearly a century after Appomattox, the legacy of the antebellum South was alive in the 1950s, and as a privileged white girl in a conservative community, she was expected to accept it without question. And I love the, I love the photo of her. I just love that sassy look. Like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> She's great. Um, okay. But from an early age... Faust also sensed that she was born into a time of upheaval when deep-rooted assumptions and inequities, gendered as well as racial, met with challenges that shook the status quo of even rural Clark County, Virginia. And perhaps most of all, Faust recognized that she was born into circumstances that made resistance not just a choice but an imperative. Uh, whether waging a perennial war with her mother over the double standard for men and women, or petitioning President Eisenhower to end school segregation at age nine, the young Faust made trouble in order to survive. Um, this looks good. Faust wasn't the only member of her generation seeking a way to live otherwise, that's in quotes, and as she entered adolescence, the civil rights, student, and anti-war movements came to full force. For Faust, that, me that meant meaning marching uh, from Selma to Montgomery in the wake of Bloody Sunday, eliminating gendered curfews at Bryn Mawr, and in the summer of 1963 and 64, joining an integrated group of fellow teenagers on journeys through the Soviet Union and the southern United States. It also meant grappling with the question of freedom and the responsibilities it might entail, with such disparate influences as Scout Finch, Albert Camus, and Chuck Berry as guides. Necessary Trouble captures how the demands of this pivotal moment to penetrate the blindness of the present, uncover the real meaning of the past, and imagine a better future became for Faust the project of a lifetime. Now with her historian's ear tuned to the deeply personal, she gives us an indelible portrait of a young woman and a nation on the cusp of change. Uh, so this is going to be really fun to read, I think. Uh, she definitely lived during a very, um, you know, tumultuous time. And uh, she's got some photos in here of her as a child. And uh, I, I like reading memoirs and, you know, people kind of looking back at their life. Um, I'm just, I've always been intrigued by that. Like where you came from and what your influences were. So again, Necessary Trouble, 
by Drew Gilpin-Faust from Ferrar, Strauss, and Giroux coming. Tentative publication date is August 22nd. So keep an eye out for that. All right. What else do we have going on here? We're making good progress, folks. We're making great progress. All right. All right. So here is a book that is out right now. I was intrigued by it, and I wanted to take a look at it. And the good folks at Johns Hopkins University Press accommodated. This is Grassroots Leviathan, Agricultural Reform and the Rural, rural North in the Slaveholding Republic by Ariel, Ariel Ron. It's not too large of a book, but it seemed pretty intriguing to me. In this sweeping look at rural society from the American Revolution to the Civil War, Ariel Ron argues that agricultural history is central, and that, that to me was intriguing, is central to understanding the nation's formative period, upending the myth that the Civil War pitted an industrial North against an agrarian South, a grassroots leviathan traces the rise of a powerful agricultural reform movement spurred by Northern farmers. Uh, Ron shows that farming dominated the lives of most Americans through almost the entire 19th century and traces how middle-class farmers and the greater Northeast built a movement of semi-public agricultural societies, fairs, and periodicals that fundamentally recast Americans' relationship to market forces and the state. Um, so that's what kind of grabbed my attention. Uh, I wanted to read this argument because uh, I've always heard this about the uh, antebellum period, you know, that it was the industrial north uh, kind of beating up on um, the agri agricultural, agri agrarian south. Um, and she's saying that that's not the case at all. So I really want to get into this and, um, and see, how, you know, how she makes this case. Um, we've got some interesting... References to, you know, you've got like the newspapers of the time. She's kind of showing the different, uh, just, I mean, maps. It's, it's everything that you need here, I think, to, to, to kind of get your, well, then we've got some tables that are, so this is, it's going to be a meaty academic read for sure, but um, I'll see how the writing style goes on this one. But we've got chapter headings such as, um, Rise of the Agricultural Reform Movement, um, the Making of Northern Economic Nationalism, uh, Toward a National Agricultural Policy Agenda, and Agricultural Reform versus the Slaveocracy. So this is all the stuff that's in my wheelhouse. I love reading the stuff. <laughs> um, and so this is from John Hopkins University Press. It's out right now, Ariel Ron's Grassroots Leviathan. So if you're interested, please look that up. Okay, next book we've got. Let's now let's skip to one that is upcoming. This is coming out in June. Uh, I don't think we have a an exact date yet. Um, this is also kind of like a memoir, or autobiography of sorts. Not an autobiography, but uh, it's it's one woman's story about what happened to her as a child. And uh, this is put out by Harper uh, Harper Harper Collins. It's kind of listed under history, Middle East, biography and autobiography, personal memoir, and political science. And this is called My Hijacking, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering by Martha Hodes. That's coming out in June. It says here, in this moving and thought-provoking memoir, the historian offers a personal look at the fallibilities of memory and the lingering impact of trauma as she goes back 50 years to tell the story of being a passenger on an airliner hijacked in 1970. Well, that's rather terrifying. Excuse me. On September 6, 1970, 12-year-old Martha Hodes and her 13-year-old sister were flying unaccompanied, terrifying, uh, back to New York City from Israel when their plane was hijacked by members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and forced to land in the Jordan Desert. Too young to understand the sheer gravity of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Martha coped by suppressing her fear and anxiety. Nearly half a century later, her memories of those six days and nights as a hostage are hazy and scattered. Was it the passage of so much time, or that her family couldn't endure the full story? 
Or had trauma made her repress such an intense life and death experience? A professional historian, Martha, wanted to find out. Drawing on deep archival research, childhood memories, and com conversations with relatives, friends, and fellow hostages, Martha Hodes sets out to recreate what happened to her and what it was like for those at home desperately hoping for their, her return. Thrown together inside a stifling jetliner, the hostages forged friendships, provoked conflicts, and dreamed up distractions. Learning about the lives and causes of their captors, some of them kind, some of them frightening, the sisters pondered a deadly divide that continues today. A thrilling tale of fear, denial, and empathy, my hijacking sheds light on the hostage crisis that shocked the world as the author comes to a deeper understanding of both about both what happened in the Jordan Desert in 1970 and her own fractured family and childhood sorrows. Um, and this is not just a... She has footnotes. This is very much well-researched. Uh, just looking at the notes and her bibliography. Um, this is amazing. So this is going to be quite, quite a powerful read. Oh my goodness. Picture of the uh, people. I think that's after they've been rescued, I think. But anyway, um, wow. You know, in 2023, not many people remember these scenes. Um, I was I was a young child in the 70s. Um, I wasn't. Uh, she was 12 years old in 1970. I wasn't born yet. But um, you know, later on in the later 70s, you know, you saw scenes like this, and it was. Uh, it's definitely of a time and place. But um, I'm looking forward to reading this again. This is being put out by Harper Collins Books. This is Martha Hode's My Hijacking, coming out in June. All right. Next book. We've got some books here, a couple of books, um, from the University of Nebraska Press. I am on their media list, and I'm getting a lot of their new releases. Um, very excited about that. Okay, looks like this one uh, is not, it's not out in the UK yet. Looks like it'll be out in the UK in August, but it's out right now for here in the States. And this is Agents of Empire, the first Oregon Cavalry in the opening of the interior, interior Pacific Northwest during the Civil War. So it's going to get a long subtitle. This is by James Robbins Jewell. Again, University of Nebraska Press. It's a beautiful naked hardcover. Um, so let me, let me read to you a little bit about here. This is out right now, if you're interested. Agents of Empire expands the his historiographical scope of Civil War studies to include the war's intersection with the history of the American West, demonstrating how the war was transcontinental in scope. Much more than a traditional Civil War regimental history, James Robbins Jewell's work delves into the operational and social conditions under which the 1st Oregon Cavalry Regiment was formed. In response to ongoing tensions and violent interactions with Native peoples determined to protect their way of life and lands, Colonel George Wright, head of the military district's a district of Oregon, asked the governor of Oregon to form a voluntary cavalry unit to protect white settlers and farmers. By using uh, local volunteers and later two additional regiments of infantry from the region, the federal government was able to draw from, from the majority of regular army troops stationed in the Pacific Northwest, uh, who were eventually sent to fight Confederate forces east of the Mississippi River. Had the 1st Oregon Cavalry failed to fulfill its responsibilities, the federal government would have, to, would have had to recall Union forces from other threatened areas and send them to Oregon and Washington Territory to quell secess secessionist unrest and indigenous resistance to land theft, resource appropriation, and murder. The 1st Oregon Cavalry ensured settler security in the Union's farthest northwest corner, thereby contributing to the Union cause. Um, so this is something I had never heard about. I, I don't know much about the 1st Oregon Cavalry. Um, and this will be a welcome addition to my Civil War history collection. Um, it's a beautiful book. And we've got, it's a very extensive bibliography. Uh, let's see if I can... This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Drew. 
All right. I think I got the auto autofocus is working again. Yay. Um, if you love like Old West history and Civil War history, you're going to probably enjoy Ag Agents of Empire. And I'm looking forward to reading it as well. Another book. Another beautiful naked hardcover book from the University of Nebraska Press. This is out right now. Um, and I was interested in this because I do read about this, even though it's kind of grim. It's grim reading, but I don't know. I think these things are important to remember. Like I said, history is the greatest teacher. Um, an instructor for living uh, in the present. And, you know, how to structure... How to, how to respond to crises in the future, and this is one way of not doing that. <laughs> or in this case, um, being aware of how people want to deny history, um, or re revise it, re rewrite it. Um, but this is called Denial of Genocides in the 21st Century. And it's, uh, it's edited by Bedros Der Dermatosian. And this is our beautiful, wow, well, our very poignant cover, very solemn. Um, a beautiful naked heart cover. I don't have the pub sheet. Um, so it's a collection of uh, different essays. Uh, we've got, let me just read the back. Throughout the 21st century, genocide denial has evolved and adapted with new strategies to augment and complement established modes of denial. In addition to outright negation, denial of genocide encompasses a range of techniques, including disputes over numbers, contestation of legal definitions, blaming the victim, and various modes of intimidation, such as threats of legal action. Arguably, the most effective strategy has been denial through the purposeful creation of misinformation. Denial of genocides in the 21st century brings together leading scholars from across disciplines uh, to add to the body of genocide scholarship that is challenged by denialist literature. So this is why it's important to read these things, is what I'm saying. Uh, it's not fun reading, but it's necessary reading. By concentrating on factors such as the role of communications and news media, global and national social networks, the weaponization of information by authoritarian regimes and political parties, uh, court cases in the Uni United States and Europe, a freedom of speech and postmodernist thought, this volume discusses how genocide denial is becoming a fact of daily life in the 21st century, which is very sad to say. But this is out right now from University of Nebraska Press. Okay. Now, upcoming book coming this fall. So I'm, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a ways out there, but I'll probably. Um, I'll probably, hopefully, have a, a finished copy so that we can revisit this again in uh, another episode of New History on the Horizon uh, as we go through the summer months and into the fall. This is coming out in September. This is called Flee North, a Forgotten Hero in the Fight for Freedom in Slavery's Borderland. Look at that cover. It's very... Uh, it's vertical in a sense that you get to see the picture on the side. Mm, wow. There's a lot of motion in this. It's a, it's a really brilliant, brilliantly conceived uh, cover. This is by Scott Shane, and it's being put out by Celadon Books. All right, coming out in September. September 19th is our date, so uh, probably have a finished copy later in the year. Um, do I have a description? Well, let me just read the back then to you. But a beautiful cover, Flee North, by Scott Shane. Born into slavery in Maryland, Thomas Smallwood, by the 1840s, was free, self-educated, and working as a shoemaker, a short walk from the U.S. Capitol. He recruited a young white activist, Charles Torrey, and together they began to organize mass escapes from Washington, Baltimore, and surrounding counties to freedom in the North. They were racing against an implacable enemy, a lucrative industry run by men like Hope H. Slatter, the region's leading slave trader, uh, that would tear one million enslaved people from their families and sell them to the brutal cotton and sugar plantations in the Deep South. 
Men, women, and children in imminent danger of being sold south turned to Smallwood, who risked his own freedom to battle what he called the most inhuman system that ever blackened the pages of history. And he documented the escapes in satirical newspaper columns, mocking the slaveholders, the slave traders, and the police who worked for them. Good for him. At a time when Americans are rediscovering a tragic and cruel history and struggling anew with the legacy of white supremacy, this book, the first to tell the extraordinary story of Smallwood, will offer complicated heroes, genuine villains, and a powerful narrative set in cities still plagued by shocking racial inequity today. Flee North by Scott Shane, September 19th of this year. Now, this book is a little bit outside of our purview. I thought I'd I, I include it anyway because I realized I somehow missed this book. Um, I'm a, I know this writer, this historian, um, and this is a meaty book. Uh, one of the guys on the podcast that I listened to uh, read this book and said it was amazing. And uh, so I wanted to, to take a look at this. This is put out by Knopf Books, Alfred A. Knopf Books. This is The Ghost at the Feast. This is out right now. It's been out for, I think, many months, a few months. The Ghost at the Feast, America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900-1941, by Robert Kagan. I'm sure many of you have heard of Robert Kagan. Um, he is a very big thinker. I think he's, quite, he's very much... Uh, Oh, he's, uh, he's a fellow at the Brookings Institution, he's a journalist, uh, he's written for the Washington Post. Um, I think I have a, another book by him, The Jungle Grows Back. Um, actually, I think this book is the second. Uh, it's supposed to follow on Dangerous Nation. So, I might get Dangerous Nation and then read that first before I dive into this one. But this is a comprehensive sweeping history of America's rise to global superpower. Um, here's our author, in case you're not aware of who Mr. Kagan is. And then we'll wrap up. At the dawn of the 20th century, the United States was one of the world's richest, most populous, most technologically advanced nations. It was also a nation divided along numerous fault lines, with conflicting aspirations and concerns pulling it in different directions. And it was a nation unsure about the role it wanted to play in the world, <clears throat> if any. Americans were the beneficiaries of a global order they had no responsibility for maintaining. Many preferred to avoid being drawn into what seemed an ever more competitive, conflictual, and militarized international environment. However, many also were eager to see the U.S. taking a share of international responsibility, working with others to preserve peace and advance civilization. The story of American foreign policy in the first four decades of the 20th century is about the effort to do both to adjust the nation to its new position without sacrificing the principles developed in the past, as one contemporary puts it. This would prove a difficult task. The collapse of British naval power, combined with the rise of Germany and Japan, suddenly placed the U.S. in a pivotal position. American military power helped defeat Germany in the First World War, and the peace that followed was significantly shaped by a U.S. president. But Americans recoiled from their deep involvement in world affairs, and for the next two decades they sat by as fascism and tyranny spread unchecked, ultimately causing the liberal world order to fall apart. America's resulting intervention in the Second World War marked the beginning of a new era for the United States and for the world. Brilliant and insightful, The Ghost of the Feast shows both the perils of American withdrawal from the world and the price of international responsibility. It's a pretty thick book. It's well over 600 pages. But again, this comes highly recommended from a source I listened to, and um, I wanted to check this out. And it's, it's a fairly new uh, book. So I kind of wanted to get this guy's, uh, get you guys, this is on, to get on your radar. It did come out this year, so, but I think it came out maybe January or February. This is Ghost, The Ghost at the Feast by Robert Kagan. All right, guys, so that is another edition. Make sure I got everything covered in this edition of New History on the Horizon. Let me know what looks good to you, what you're excited about, what you're adding to your TBR, and uh, we'll have another episode very soon. Like I said, the weather is not curtailing the mailman, and we have new arrivals all the time. So until next time, BookTube, thanks for joining me here at the History Shelf. Take care. Bye-bye.